ambassadors of this open forum together uh, and supported by uh, IFLA, International Federation uh, of Library Associations and Institutions. Um, we have Stuart Hamilton with us who kindly um, accepted to be present here and um, to co-organize the open forum. Um, what is this open forum about and what we would like to do to present and to discuss mainly today with you? It's an outcome of the previous IGF uh, meetings the, uh, and the workshops that we organized or co-organized on the subject of uh, vulnerable people and ICTs. So marginalized group in the information society or how ICTs could uh, help assist vulnerable marginalized group to be better integrated uh, in, in economic uh, and social uh, life. So uh, the result, one of the results of the um, workshop last year, somehow it was the working group which was created completely naturally. And uh, the working group engaged to uh, work on the, on, on the issue and maybe to um, develop a kind of recommendations um, for, uh, for countries on how to better uh, integrate the, the mentioned groups. So what we tried actually to do during this first year is to identify the areas um, we think to be important for, for the uh, for marginalized and vulnerable groups and what we would like to discuss with you and mainly to have your input. We have with us and we're very uh, proud and happy to have with us uh, and to have the support from ICANN. We have with us Nigel Hickson present here. Thank you so much for joining and I think um, Nigel ha will, uh, will present the message from the CEO and President of ICANN and uh, we would like to thank uh, once again ICANN for, for this support um, because we think that the issue is not addressed for the moment um, not correctly, but it is discussed. But as we can see, um, I would say it's not the most se sexy issue for, for Internet governance community. So we would like uh, to address this as well. And I think that is why the support of ICANN, of uh, other institutions, is so important in order to address, to better address the issue. We also have with us Anna from the government of Portugal. Thank you, Anna, for joining. And once again, thank you for the support of the, of the government. Stuart, would, would you like to? <laughs> Thank you, Yulia. Um, we've all been told that we have to essentially almost put the microphones into our mouths in order for the remote participation to be able to hear us. Um, I'm here representing IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Uh, and actually, I recognize many of you in the room from the session that took place uh, just before lunch. So uh, I'm going to try not to repeat myself, but at the same time, I think there's a few things that I'd like to, to sort of restate. Um, IFLA has been coming to the Internet Governance Forum for about five or six years now. And during that time, we focused on a number of issues in the workshops that we participated in um, and in the plenaries. One of those has been about access to information through more balanced copyright frameworks. But more recently, we've been placing a great emphasis on um, public access to ICTs in the community. And last year in Azerbaijan, Yulia approached us to participate uh, in a workshop on access to ICTs for vulnerable and disadvantaged groups. And we were very happy to take part in that workshop because um, public libraries and many other types of libraries serve all sorts of groups in the community and in fact um, our kind of mission statement if one could be said to exist would be to make sure that everybody in the community gets equal access to information. Um, so we took part in that workshop which we felt was a, was a very good thing for us to do. It had some very, very good partners. Uh, Anna was there, uh, other people from various NGOs working in the areas of cybercrime and protection of vulnerable people. And we followed it up um, with Yulia with a workshop in the European Internet Governance Forum in June this year in Portugal. Um, that workshop went very well. And in fact, uh, I've distributed a document, uh, which I'm sure Yulia will talk a little bit more about in just a moment, that does contain a set of recommendations 
that came out of the workshop in Portugal. From IFA's perspective, um, I wouldn't say that this is a simple issue, but our approach to it is relatively simple. Um, libraries all over the world are already working with marginalised and disadvantaged groups to provide them with public access to ICTs, uh, but there is still much more that we could do if we are able to work with the correct partners in the development community, if we're able to work with the correct partners in uh, government policy areas and with partners in the business community and, and partners such as ICANN, of course. Um, we really feel that there are a lot of opportunities to increase access to information for vulnerable and marginalised groups if we take advantage of what our sector has to offer. And that is a space, a trusted place in the community where people can come, uh, can feel safe, uh, and can get access and training to public, uh, to ICTs that offer them access to information, offer them access to skills, uh, to jobs, and to really the processes of civic engagement. So I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm pleased to be able to be um, able to be on hand to moderate the discussion and uh, to take part. I'm pleased to see that there are a few of my colleagues in the audience from library groups. We've had a few librarians join us this week here in the IGF for the first time and I'm very, very keen to see a louder voice for the library and information community in internet governance debates. But uh, I'll leave it there and pass it back to, to Yulia. Thank you so much, Stuart. Um, I, I think we need to, uh, when we speak about um, vulnerable people and marginalized communities, to underline, because the, um, the question is always raised, what is the definition of vulnerable? Uh, when we speak about vulnerable people uh, and marginalized, we refer to the definition given by the Tunis Agenda of the for the Information Society. Um, and I also would like to, to, un to, to speak a little bit more about the working group and the members uh, who, who, who took this engagement to work with us. Uh, we have um, the representative of the African Union, of ITU, of World Economic Forum, of uh, OCD, um, OECD, uh, of we have the support of the Council of Europe, of the civil society, as well as uh, the, um, a number of uh, representatives of the private sector. So I would like to thank them. They were unable to travel to Bali, uh, but uh, they, um, they helped us and we worked all together during this year. Um, I would like uh, to turn now, uh, maybe, um, and to ask Nigel, why do you think I can, can or think it is important to, su to support this kind of initiatives, and specifically, um, why I can think it is important to have a voice of vulnerable communities uh, concerning internet um, governance issues and information society issues? So you've got to talk very close to the microphone, is that the idea? Yeah. Well, good, good, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much, Julia, for in, in inviting me uh, to, to, to speak this afternoon. Um, I mean, cl clearly this is, a, uh, this is an issue of importance. I, I, I used to work in the, in the UK government, and it was always an issue of how you, how you, if you like, reached out to all parts of the community in, 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 in terms of internet access, in terms of bringing people on board and uh, governments of whatever complexion of whatever place in the world have, have tackled this problem in, in various ways. Now I, I'm not sitting or standing by, uh, before you this afternoon and suggesting that uh, ICANN has any more insight into this than uh, any other organization. Uh, what I think is clear however and uh, I think it was striking what we, we've just heard about libraries because I mean uh, you know, s sometimes you think of libraries, and first of all, I, I thought, what's the connection, you know, between libraries and marginalised and disadvantaged groups? But uh, I mean, of course, there is, you know, there th there is a, a connection. I'm not saying that's an absolute connection, but I I think what what is clear here is is that we have to provide access to communications, and we have to provide access to communications in a way, access to the internet, in a way that's understandable, affordable, 
and attributable to the people that want it. And ICANN has no magic wand in, in, in doing this in all aspects. We don't provide broadband, we don't provide infrastructure. But I think something that we do provide is, is, is domain names in different types of languages. And the new introduction, and only uh, yesterday we were able to announce that the first new generic top-level domains, and some of you know ICANN has just introduced, or in the process of introducing, there's only 22 generic top-level domains at the moment. We're in the process of perhaps introducing another 1,000 into the route of the Internet over the next uh, year that people have applied for in a, in a, in a fairly extensive process. And the, and the first four or five to go into the route of the Internet perhaps as soon as ne uh, next week or perhaps even later this week uh, will be international domain names in, in, the, in the Russian language, uh, in the Chinese language, uh, and in the Indi Indian language, and, and, and in Indian script. And th therefore, this is, this is very significant. I, I'm not, not suggesting that this, this touches all marginalized groups, but it certainly allows people in communities to, to be able to uh, take part in the Internet that possibly didn't before. There's one other thing I, I, I want to say in this debate, which I, I, I think is relevant, and that is the relevancy of an open and a single Internet. Because we are not, and we, we, we found this out in, in, in the UK when we were trying to uh, extend the reach of, of, of broadband into communities, uh, and I'm sure it's the same in other countries as well. We are not going to attract marginalized groups onto the internet unless it is a single open and secure internet and that, that's something at the heart of the, of the ICANN mission. We're, we're just not going to do it. When we asked in the UK only two or three years ago, you know, UK ministers used to say, why are these people not on the internet? You know, is it, is it money? Is it, you know, what, what is it? And it's a whole variety of reasons. I mean, some of it is physical access, of course, but a lot of it is the perception of what the Internet is to them, and that is something that I think we're all responsible for. We have to have an attractive environment in which to use the Internet to get people to use it. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel, for this uh, opening statement, and once again, the uh, your support to this uh, the support of ICANN to this initiative. Actually, it was one of the questions I, would, I wanted to raise. Um, how do you think the new JTLDs program could assist these vulnerable groups or, um, you know, to help them to better integrate uh, by, the new, by the use of new opportunities uh, in the social life and economic life of their societies? Yeah, well, I mean... You know, I, I, I don't think we want to overemphasize the point. I mean, one of, one of the great advantages of having new in, international domain names uh, is, is that you can have uh, domain names in, in, in Chinese and Cyrillic script. And I'm not suggesting that just doing that is, 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 a, is an answer to disadvantaged and marginalized people. But the, I, I, I assume there are, there are people that have hitherto not been able to or, or, or felt reluctant to take part in the Internet because of the dominance of... Latin scripts on the internet because of this perception that the internet is, is you know, is, is a sort of Anglo-Saxon sort of, you know, sort of entity or, or, or whatever, you know, with just a few French people, you know. So <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it's, so I think, you know, the ability to have in, in internet in different scripts must, must help. And of course, it's, I mean, the next billion internet users isn't going to come from uh, Europe or North America. It's, you know, it, it comes from, it comes from Africa, it comes from, uh, it comes from China. And India, so so, I mean, I think this this much help must 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 help. You know, not not a complete answer to, to the question at all. But well, I I do think it, it it really does have a strong possibility of, of helping in that for the first time on on that top level, as you say, over the next year or so, there's the possibility to uh, direct people in a in a much easier way to resources that could help them through domain names in their own script. I mean, it's, it's a very simple step, and obviously then it goes on to depend on the quality of the resource that lives behind that URL, but nevertheless, it's the sort of thing that, uh, to, to keep hitting the same drum, that libraries can introduce to their patrons 
and can actually point them in the right direction. So, so you know, it's certainly something that my community can work with. Uh, we'd like actually now to have um, a discussion with you. We have identified during this year of our engagement, of the engagement of the, of the group, um, a number of areas that you can see uh, on the screen uh, that uh, came out from uh, previous discussions during uh, the IGF or in the, at different forums and which were underlined as being uh, very important for, for, the, uh, for the target group we, we work with. So uh, we would like just to have, we, you have a, um, a kind of very first draft um, that, uh, that, is, uh, that you can take from, from the first table and we can, um, um, can give it to you uh, later on, um, which explains actually why these areas, how we have arrived to these areas, and you are very welcome to comment and to send us your suggestions and we will be very happy to um, to work on this together and specifically to know more about needs and solutions because we think that the recommendations we try to put uh, together, uh, the most important is to answer the needs and to have the solutions and to integrate the solutions which we already developed and already exist. Um, so we would like to launch a discussion. Do you have comments, ideas? Uh, do you think there are other areas we you would like to see uh, among the, the addressed uh, questions. Um, we would like to have your experiences if... Please, you have a mic. Please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Tarek Zaman. I'm uh, uh, with ISIF uh, and APNEC here. And I'm working with the University of Malaysia, Sarawak. Uh, we are working in the different indigenous communities of Malaysia. Uh, one of the things that I would like uh, uh, to highlight here is uh, other than, I mean, uh, including the ICT, the radio and the television uh, role in um, uh, giving voice to the vulnerable peoples. Uh, if you would like to explain something, especially uh, in terms of library relationship with these type of tools. Uh, the second one is, yeah, the perception, the issues of perception is very much important. I just want to highlight one of the experience. Uh, while we were working on the indigenous n botanical knowledge of the community, and uh, yeah, the uh, indigenous communities are very much sensitive on these type of information to store or to transform it from oral uh, uh, structure to a documented digitized structure. So. Uh, because there is a whole ecosystem, whole structure which governing this type of information, which is which was previously in tacit and implicit form, and now we are making it in an explicit form. The libraries uh, in Australia are really working on uh, is a data as a server or a data storage place a space for traditional knowledge, uh, but. Uh, we felt that the communities are not that much easily acceptable to this type of concept unless that they have the physical control of the data. It is not only the logical control, but the physical control. And in terms of that, then the data server, local data server uh, concept was very, very uh, uh, means uh, supportive for us to make the community understand where the data will be stored and how uh, it will be accessed. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. The, the first, if I, if I was hearing you correctly, the first uh, point that you were bringing in was um, uh, the use of uh, other sorts of ICTs, uh, television, radio, I guess, uh, local radio, for access to information for these groups. Um, from a library perspective, I know that in um, certain parts of Africa, there's been a connection between community libraries and the use of radio for um, sharing health information, for example. I, I have to confess I don't know too much about what we've really done with television. I do have some colleagues in the audience who may be able to, to mention things like that. But certainly, if you think about our community, we're very much used to um, um, improvising, shall we say. We are quite well known for having camel libraries, boat libraries, donkey libraries, horse libraries. Um, you know, there are many parts of the world, particularly in remote and rural communities, where, you know, our general conception of what a library looks like just really has to go out of the window. 
And that, of course, means that the sort of people that staff those libraries uh, are able to improvise. So in terms of new technologies, Librarians actually have been adapting quite well to new technologies for the last 50, if not more, years. We don't tend to have a great reputation in some respects, but we get on with our jobs quite quietly, and we get on with things, and very often we're using new technologies before other professions. Uh, but enough blowing the trumpet for librarians there. Um, when it comes to access to traditional and indigenous knowledge, this is something that we've been working on quite a lot, particularly within my organisation. Um, we work, IFLA at least, works at a very high level to try to protect and make available uh, indigenous um, uh, knowledge and cultural expressions. We work at the World Intellectual Property Organization to ensure that the legal frameworks for which some of this information is, is transferred and stored uh, are robust um, and in fact benefit everybody, not just people coming in, taking the information out and reusing it. At a community level, we have policies. We have a, a multicultural library manifesto, which essentially is a, a guidance document for librarians who wish to work with diverse populations. Um, it includes, uh, obviously, sensitivity issues uh, and a number of things that librarians really need to be aware of, because you touched upon some in your intervention, of course, the actual feeling that once this information is taken from intangible form and transferred into, just say for the sake of argument, digital form, what happens to it next? Who is storing it? In some indigenous cultures, there are levels of information that are available to you as you grow older or if you come from certain parts within your community. And of course, the internet is about making it available for everybody. So how do you actually ensure that those traditions can be held? So. I am pleased to say it's something that our community has been uh, working on and I've, uh, if, you if you go to ifla.org and search for the Multicultural Library Manifesto you'll find a, a good deal of resources on that. So I hope that answers your question in a couple of ways. I wanted to pick as well the, um, your statement. I think um, it will be very useful probably to add one of the areas, the role of mass media so we can ensure that uh, this is addressed as well uh, if we we'll go for the recommendations or in a, in a kind of paper we would like to circulate and to, uh, to present maybe next year or at least work on it uh, in the coming, in the coming um, months. Um, as well as to pay attention to traditional content um, as maybe part of the local content. Uh, we do have already um, with the multilingu multilingualism um, do we have other, thank you for, for, for this, for, um, uh, do we, do, would you like to share, please? Okay, uh, my name is uh, Yudo Giri Suchahyo. Uh, I work as a lecturer at University of Indonesia, and my mom is a librarian, uh, now she's retired, so hopefully it's directly related to the IFLA. Okay, <laughs> so I just want to share uh, what happens in Indonesia towards the information society and access to ICT services, etc. Because Indonesia is actually, as you know, a large country. We have about 17,000 uh, islands, uh, and we have about 500 local languages, so you can imagine. And our government is actually wants to comply with the WSIS, uh, where we have a target that by 2015, 50% 50 of our population will have access to information. So. Uh, Lots of initiative has been done by uh, civil society and also government for this. One example is that our government uh, set up a mobile internet cafe. It's like a small truck which is converted to, to a mobile internet and they have distributed to all municipalities in Indonesia. And uh, the, the small truck will go to rural areas, villages, etc. to give access to the uh, rural people. So. Here in Indonesia, the vulnerable, we can, we can mention it is not the uh, people with disability, etc., although it's also included, but more to the rural people who doesn't have access to, who don't have access to the, uh, to the information. So, uh, and then uh, the only problem is that, uh, as you can see, uh, after we give access to information, then we realize that the local content, our local content is actually not so much. Uh, for them, so that's uh, one thing that we should work on. Yes, we can give Facebook or we can give access to Google, etc., to them. But if let's say most of the content is actually uh, in English 
uh, and when you speak uh, to a uh, farmer or let's say fisherman, etc., then uh, within a couple of months, then they will get bored and uh, move uh, move away from the internet. So that's something that we really uh, that for us to really work on. Uh, I'm also uh, one of the chair of the .id CCTLD. Uh, we have sp spoken about the option of developing the internationalized domain names for non-Latin scripts. As you can see we, here, we have so many scripts as well. Uh, one of the most uh, famous may be the Japanese language, Hanacharaka. Uh, but still, uh, two days ago, we have discussion with the uh, ICANN as well, and they also remind us that the road to have an IDN is actually still so long, because we also need to evaluate the acceptance of the people here, whether we have a local newspaper with the non-Latin uh, scripts, etc., and whether we have the software to, uh, to write the content uh, in the local languages, etc. Now, other than that, our government also have uh, launched a new regulation, new government regulation on public information, uh, communication, information public. So, what's public information act? Access something like that. So uh, it gives uh, it gives uh, uh, responsibility to go to the government to give to give access of information to the people. Now the the initiative of having the the uh, mobile internet cafe this is actually a public private cooperation. So I guess I have mentioned most of the topics over there with the Indonesian example. Who knows that uh, other countries can learn something of uh, what we have done here. Thank you. Th thank you so much. We, um, we do have a couple of minutes for, uh, I think the, the, it's, it's what we, um, we wanted to engage this discussion actually and to have and to know what's going on in, in, in other countries. Do, do we have someone else who would like to share the experience of your country or please? I have, uh, I actually have Please introduce question. yourself. Uh, my name is Omar Ansari. I'm from uh, Afghanistan, working for the National ICT Alliance of Afghanistan, and uh, uh, I run a business called Technation, where we provide uh, <coughs> community technology services, incubator management, and support to different institutions to use technology as a tool for development. Um, uh, my question is. Um, uh, we're talking about open data and uh, e-government solutions and uh, the internet and connectivity. There's one thing very important and that's called uh, software. And, uh, and uh, what's more in important, especially for the developing countries, is open source software. Well, open source, uh, 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 it's, it's either free or very cheap where the source code is open for improvements and uh, modification and collaboration as well between various developer uh, communities. Uh, how do uh, uh, IFLA and, um, uh, and I can see open source? Um, and uh, in how, what, what are your support initiatives uh, for countries, let's say like Afghanistan, other countries who are very new to the content in the software um, industries? Thank you. Um, okay, yeah. Open source is something that we most definitely support. Um, if there's a membership organization with uh, over 1,500 members, and one of those uh, members is called Electronic Information for Libraries, or EIFL. Uh, website is eifl.org. And they have a free and open source software program which is aimed at libraries to get them to implement free and open source software solutions. So... Um, in a slight cop-out, as we would say, and conscious of time, I'm going to direct you straight away there and give you my card afterwards so I can link you up with those people. But in, in general, it's those sorts of solutions that, that, we, uh, that we support. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of things, and the gentleman from Indonesia also um, reminded me that some of these issues that we're, that we're talking about here with regards to local content and open source, this really crosses developed and developing countries. Um, I'm thinking about the way that you've still got um, elderly and um, 
marginalised users in European countries who come into libraries not knowing anything about the internet and one of the ways that we bring them into a safe space where they can learn about it is through local content. We use family history resources or things about the environment in which people live and that makes them much more comfortable. So I thought that was quite interesting. But then in open source terms, one of the countries which is doing the most with open source in its libraries is Finland, which is actually one of the leaders for, for library services in the world. They have a wonderful thing in their central library in, in Helsinki called the Laptop Doctor and you can bring your laptop into him and he will fix it for you and I believe if you choose to get rid of your Windows operating system there on the spot and let him install Linux uh, it's a free service um, and he'll talk you all the way through switching over to Linux so it's the Finns who are really sort of pushing that but um, I'd be happy to share more information about this open source software program with you and I'd also like to introduce you to a colleague of mine at the back because we've had three uh, members from the Afghanistan library community here uh, this week in Bali, and if they're still around, I'd love to introduce you to them. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I'll, I'll be very brief. That's uh, yeah, that's quite <laughs> quite incredible. What happens in Finland? Uh, <laughs> open source software. Yes, I yeah. I mean, I, I I don't think ICANN has a formal position, but 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 clearly, I mean, as we were talking about earlier, I mean, it's all to do with access and barriers, isn't it? And you know the. The fewer barriers you can put in in, 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 in place in terms of uh, uh, allowing someone to to access, the, the better. I mean, I think the other point about local content is, uh, and again, I'm not trying to say that new uh, generic top-level domains are going to uh, uh, sort of create a whole whole new paradigm here. But but I think there is there is something about local content, and uh, certainly, again, I, I fully support what, what you were saying in that if you can bring you know, if someone comes into a library, I'm sure, and, 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 and says, you know, uh, and you, you're trying to get them on the internet, you know, being able to show them the local bus timetables or the local, you know, when you're in a restaurant is probably more, more relevant than showing them the BBC News or, you know, CNN, which they say they, they can get at home and that's why they've come to the library to get away from it. So, uh, so I think, and domain names play a, play a role here. And, and, and personally, I, I mean, the new generic top level the main program for me is all about community names. Uh, I mean, that's where I, I, I see a real, uh, you know, something that's really important. And localities having their own generic top-level domain, whether it's in whatever language, I think is going to help people write content uh, for, for local communities, and that, that, that must be positive. I mean, in, in terms of international domain names, I, I mean, I, I, I take your point that, you know, in, a, in an environment where you've got so many different cultures, so many different islands. I mean, not, and, and you know, no one is going to, in, in the last generic top level domain round, no one's going to spend $165,000 in, in, in applying for a domain name for a, you know, a, a small island or, 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 or something. Well, I mean, some people might, but very few. What I, what I hope ICANN will be able to do in, in going forward in the next round on uh, uh, domain names, uh, generic top level domain names, is have a uh, a, a completely new approach where we perhaps are able to address uh, the issues of, of cost and the issues of, of the real need to reach out to a more diversified community in, in, in terms of providing uh, such domains. And so hopefully something will happen on that. Thank you once again, uh, Nigel. I think it gives us also ideas on in which direction we, we have to work. Uh, I think we can take five more minutes and we have uh, uh, one question, uh, one remote question and we'd like to have uh, um, the point of view of Anna from the government of Portugal. Uh, so please be short, you know, we have only five minutes, please. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, my name is Michael Rotet. I'm representing the ISP industry from Europe as well as from Germany. Um, what we are currently, uh, what in Europe, uh, what is working with is uh, on, a, on a guide on human rights for Internet users. You will hear more about it by the end of this week. Um, it's currently in a draft status, but I think this covers quite, quite a lot of, of what is on, on the page there. Already from the Council of Europe developed and used in uh, many countries even outside of, of Europe are guidelines on human rights for internet service providers. Um, 
or even for game developers, but th this is a little bit outside. But uh, what, what I can imagine is if you have a, s a certain set of, uh, f of fundamental things which are important for the group of vulnerables, and you put it additionally on, uh, on guidelines, and whoever signs up for it uh, gets uh, a stamp on his web page, uh, IGF proof for vulnerables or something like that, I think this would help people to know their rights even uh, and to know what they can expect in other countries and puts pre put pressure on those countries which do not uh, develop. In terms of access, uh, access um, to, to internet or to information is normally a, a very national thing. It's up to the country to provide th this access, which means in, ter in turn you have to put pressure on countries, on uh, governments of countries uh, in, in order to provide appropriate access for, for vulnerables. And uh, this is, I think, the hard part of, of everything. Everything else can be uh, done, and I know there are a lot of initiatives for supporting blind people or, um, or for those groups uh, already on the way. Someone should collect everything and then trying to put it, put it together and that, that would be my remarks to uh, what is on the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I think it's, it's a wonderful idea. I would be happy to, to work uh, actually together to have this uh, um, an additional to the guide because it was already a work done and I was also involved in this, in this, uh, in this work, say, partly. So it would be a fantastic idea, I think, to compile effort and our efforts and to, uh, to move together on... on um, on, on this. Um, I think we have uh, one, one question from the remote participants. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Alejandro Acosta. I am from Venezuela. I am an ISOC ambassador and also your remote moderator. And well, it is just a comment. You mentioned a few minutes ago that if anybody from the audience have an experience, uh, in this topic, I can share it with you. In Venezuela, we had, uh, I, I believe, a, a successful implementation of connecting libraries to internet. Um, it was quite good. Uh, it was ma mainly oriented in the rural areas. It, it, in fact, it is working. It's maybe it has more than six or seven years. I helped, uh, I participated a lot in designing the network. And regarding the open source software and maybe not open source software, uh, at the beginning, the implementation was done using Microsoft, but uh, maybe two years later, we moved everything to open source, and that's the way it is working right now. The only thing that I would like to point out is that it is some rural areas are working with satellite links, which are usually slow. But well, sometimes you can do you no, know, you can do any, you cannot do anything else. So uh, okay. I would like to promote the use of fiber, even in as, as as much as possible. Thank you. Thank, thank you for this. I think we have definitely to close in the, in two minutes, um, two, two three minutes. I would like to um, to invite Anna to. Um, to make the statement why to support this initiative from the government of Portugal uh, and also to share with us already the work uh, which was done uh, and I um, refer to the publication. Um, Anna, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, um, I have only two, uh, two minutes, so I, I will be really, really short. Um, but I'm, I have to say that uh, t uh, today during the meeting that we had uh, about the national and the regional initiatives of the uh, IGF, uh, it was asked uh, which themes do we discuss normally uh, at, the, uh, at the national and, and the regional uh, initiatives that are not discussed here at the global uh, I IGF. And uh, Nigeria, uh, together with Portugal, uh, we underline the, 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 the lack of sessions about uh, e inclusion, about empowerment, about c capacity building. Um, so uh, all this part of ICT and society is missing here. So it's uh, interesting. Um, 
Well, uh, in, in Portugal, uh, since 1997, so for more than 15 years, uh, that we are working with what is now called vulnerable people. Um, and uh, we, uh, we uh, work um, with uh, uh, people with the functional uh, limitations. Uh, and uh, we did a lot of things uh, with these uh, citizens uh, uh, with special needs, uh, which uh, includes the increased use of sign language, closed ca uh, caption, and audio description on television. Another thing, uh, another thing that we did is uh, uh, to put the ATM, you know, the, the, the money machines, um, with the uh, interface access, uh, accessible to visually impaired, and this exists since 1998. Uh, uh, then we, we have an internet safety uh, in the formal curriculum, uh, digital inclusion centers, and digital literacy and access to ICTs, uh, which includes ICT and the elderly, uh, open and free ICT training sessions all over the country, municipal li uh, um, libraries, inclusion agents of national coverage, ICT in remote rural areas, and the recognition of digital skills acquired in informal and no formal learning context. But the most important thing now that w we are uh, trying to setting up uh, on top of this is, a, is an uh, ICT and society network. And uh, this ICT and society ne uh, network will be uh, launched on the 29th of October. Uh, with whom? With uh, professors from uh, the universities and, uh, and the polytechnics uh, from Portugal, from all the, all the region, uh, because we conclude that we, c we cannot be dependent on the change of government and the, on, the, on the funding uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the government. So we have to have this uh, civil society mobilized um, and uh, not to depend uh, from uh, uh, outsiders and, uh, and political changes. Um, so it, it is interesting because we are going to have 21 professors, well, professors that are uh, uh, dealing with uh, ICT and uh, society uh, issues. And they, they will be um, the coordinators of the uh, 21st, uh, tw uh, uh, 21 regions in, uh, in Portugal. Doing what? Um, they, they, will, um, they will boost uh, the digital literacy and the digital uh, inclusion in, in that particular region. So we have evidence how is now the, the digital literacy and the digital inclusion. And in uh, about six months, we, we are going to measure what they did with whom. We are encouraging, uh, encouraging them to, to, to work with the, all the stakeholders of the region, including, of course, the private sector, um, and, and try to, uh, to do partnership with them. Uh, and in six months, we are going to measure uh, if the evidence we had uh, now, it, it is the same or not. And in one year, again, uh, we, we are going to monitor. And we will we'll see what were the best, uh, the best practices um, that really worked out and that uh, allow to increase the literacy in a particular region and help to uh, uh, increase the, um, or decrease the, no, increase the inclusion, the, 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 the digital inclusion, sorry. Increase, decrease, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. We, I think we know the <laughs> pressure because of the three minutes. Thank you for sharing these initiatives in really a very short uh, uh, momentum of time. I would like also to mention that um, the, the, the Ministry of ICTs um, and other departments, they made the uh, publication uh, that they prepared for the European Dialogue on Internet Governance in June. And it's a publication on vulnerable people in ICTs, the situation in Portugal. Uh, 
well, Anna has the, <laughs> the book. And this booklet, I believe, will be disseminated later on this week um, in, at the IGF and is uh, at least available at their website and at uh, our website, which is www.vulnerableinplural.eu. Please visit uh, this website to follow up uh, our work. Um, I would like just to sum up as a matter of conclusion before going for one minute final statement. Um, to, to sum up how we would like to proceed now, uh, we will uh, definitely include all comments and suggestions. Uh, work out uh, on the areas identified here by adding the areas that we, we, just, uh, we just mentioned before. Um, and maybe uh, draft a kind of short recommendations for this particular target uh, group, vulnerable people, how uh, for, for national, for, for countries at national or regional level, how to better um, um, integrate them in the, in the information society. And I think it will be definitely interesting to work and to follow what Michael mentioned um, as, a, as a suggestion. And to have a kind of uh, very short uh, notice on how it could be implemented. Uh, afterwards, uh, we had already an interest and um, the, the cooperation on the possible implementation of these recommendations in Portugal, and this is why we would like once again to thank the, for, for the support um, in India, and we would like to call uh, to other countries um, who are interested to work together to maybe see how we could implement this or work together or whatever, please contact us, visit our website, www.vulnerable.eu, or um, we will disseminate the contact details in a, in a minute. Um, so I would like uh, also to thank, we were enabled, unfortunately, due to the technical problems in the room, to have this um, support from the European Economic and Social Committee, from the President, Mr. Malos, uh, who uh, personally engaged to support the initiative. We'd like to thank the um, uh, European Economic and Social Committee and Mr. Malos, as well as um, uh, Fadi Shehade for his personal engagement and for, we'd like to thank Nigel Hickson for really taking time and um, bringing his personal engagement to this initiative. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Stuart, and all members of the group and, of course, audience, and would like to uh, give uh, a floor to... In summary, I'd like to say something very, very short. Um, IFLA loves coming to the IGF. We get to learn a lot of stuff from a lot of people and we get to share a lot of information about what it is that libraries do. Uh, however, there are ways in which we can make a very concrete difference by, making, uh, by engaging with some of the processes which are currently ongoing around the world to actually make some of the things that we're talking about um, shall we say, a policy reality. And I'm talking about things like the WISIS plus 10 review, and I'm talking about things like the process that is leading to the um, post-2015 development framework, which is being currently discussed by the United Nations. So if anyone in the room is interested in what IFLA is trying to do in those uh, processes, and what we are trying to do is to ensure that access to information is recognized as a fundamental pillar for development, then I welcome you to come along uh, to room 10 at 4.30 today where the Dynamic Coalition on Public Access in Libraries is meeting and talking about concrete outcomes rather than learning from each other. We're talking about how we can get things done. Thank you very much for coming along to this meeting, though. I think it's been very interesting.